play. I don't understand why you have wings if you're just going to float on a cloud, right? Well, we're not going to get wings. We're probably not going to have a cloud. I hope we definitely don't have a harp. I, I want some kind of drum myself. But I think that uh, heaven is not like that at all, at all. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to start with verse 6. And I want to point something out to you right from the very beginning before I get to use my holy imagination. Okay? Chapter 2, verse, start with verse 6. Yet among the mature we do not impart wisdom, although it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age, who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages of our glory. None of the rulers of this age understand this. For if they had, then they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, listen to this, verse 9, But as it is written, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love Him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. The Holy Spirit tells us this is going to be a great place. It's going to be an awesome place because the Holy Spirit imparts wisdom on us. But our eyes and our flesh and our minds cannot even comprehend what heaven's going to be like. In fact, if you were to take your physical body that you have right now and enter into heaven, it would not be enjoyable for you. Heaven would not be fun for you. If you could take your physical body, the one that you have right now, and the memories that you have right now, and the, the uh, intentions and the desires and the wants that you have right now, if you were to go to heaven, that would not be good for you or for me. We're not made for that yet. We still have this flesh that's saturated with getting what it wants. And heaven's not about getting what we want. Heaven's so much more. So we're going to dive into a little bit of that today. First thing I want you to know is that heaven is a real place. It's not a, a, a big ball of energy. It's not a, a euphoria. It is an actual place. In Hebrews chapter 13, it refers to heaven as a city. And in fact, remember I told you, anywhere where God's throne is, is heaven. We know that in Revelation, we see a city coming down from heaven, and it sits on the new Jerusalem. This is the one that Karen was talking about, that has the 12 gates and the streets of gold, and all of those wonderful imagery that we hear about and read about in Revelation. It's a real place. It's a prepared place. Jesus in John 14, 2 says, I'm going to prepare a place. It's a prepared place. How do you prepare a big ball of energy like some religions teach where we will become the energy of the earth and the universe? How do you prepare that? And how do you go there and experience what we're going to experience? Heaven is a real, literal, tangible place. And it's a place that Jesus has prepared for us. It's a prepared place. I read one article this week, and it talked about the no mores of heaven. Heaven is a place of no mores, not no s'mores. That's what somebody heard in the first service. It's not going to be any s'mores in heaven? Maybe I slurred. I don't know. But it's a place of no mores. Ezekiel 28, 24 talks about a coming place where we will not be bothered by the thorns and the th thistles of a contentious neighbor. Anybody have neighbors that you don't get along with? Don't raise your hand. They might be here. <laughs> Anybody going to have an issue four days from now in your home with some family members that you love from afar <laughs> or actually in your house? This turkey is dry. You just want to kick them, don't you? Anybody have any of those in your house? I don't want to do the dishes. It's her turn to do the dishes. I don't want to share this toy with you. It's my toy. I got it first. Anybody have some contention in your home? There's no contention in heaven. If there's dishes to be washed, we'll be fighting over who gets to do it. Isn't that weird? 
We're going to want to serve. It's a place where there's no more thorns and thistles of contentious neighbors. They're probably not going to be there anyway. (laughs) That's hard for me to say. I probably shouldn't say that. No more striving with people. Four days from now, you may have to strive with somebody. Five days from now, you're definitely going to strive with somebody if you're going out on Black Friday. Anybody do Black Friday shopping? If you do, you're of the devil. (laughs) Just kidding. I I always say that because Donna's the only one that raised her hand. (laughs) Yes, yes, that was a good one. All right, so Friday... There's going to be people camping out in front of Target at 2 o'clock in the morning waiting for the doors to open, right? Because there's a mountain of TVs they're going to sell for $39. Had a family member find this out a few years ago. So we kept the kids so that they could go stand outside the Target in line waiting to get in for these limited TVs for $49. So they got in, they were bustling, you know, jostling around trying to get back there and he got his TV got in the buggy someone's trying to take it from him he's fighting he got it yes I won I won they forgot something had to go back on Monday when he got there on Monday there was a mountain of $49 TVs with nobody around he could have just walked up grabbed his TV he's never been Black Friday shopping again Black Friday shopping is the epitome of contentious people fighting over things that they want. They don't need them, but they want them, right? Well, the Bible says there's not going to be any contention there. No no striving in heaven. It's also said there's a place, heaven's going to be a place where there's no more hunger or thirst. Revelation 7 tells us that. It's not a big deal for Americans. We, we We don't really put ourselves in places where we're going to get overly hungry or overly thirsty. We, we can go get what we want. We can just go right in there, get water right out of the sink if we want. Do you know that one out of ten people in the world are malnourished? One out of ten people in the world irrigate their gardens with their wastewater. Six out of ten people in the world have zero access to clean water. No more hunger and no more thirst means so much more to them than to us. But there's no hunger and no thirst in heaven. Revelation chapter 7 tells us there's no more tears like this. No more tears in heaven. Perfect illustration. That's not going to happen in heaven. You know, there's three, three types of tears. There's basal tears. These are the tears that, that uh, keep your eyes lubricated. And the professionals say there's 10 ounces. You use 10 ounces of fluid every day keeping your eyes irrigated. Do you know that? 10 ounces of water goes across your eyes, down the back of your throat, or possibly down your nose, and escapes from your face like that. Did you know that... Those 10 ounces of fluid have to be replenished. That's why we're to drink water so often. And those, those, the escape of that fluid is the reason why when you have a, a slobber fist, your nose runs like crazy when you're crying, right? You got to wipe when you're, when you're crying, right? Those are, those are basal tears. The second kind of tear is called uh, the irritant tear. It's a reflexive tear. It's what happens when you get dust in your eyes. Anybody mulching leaves? Anybody mulching leaves this time of year? I did. I did yesterday. All that dust is up in the air, gets in your eyes, and the tears water, and they have to clean that out, right? The third kind of tear is actually a tear that's caused by a hormone in your body. Your endocrine system, your your cerebral uh, part of your brain senses that you are in grief And tells your endocrine system to send a hormone to your eyes and your eyes begin to water. So when you're grieving over a lost one, a loved one, a hurt or sick child, your body knows that and it sends a hormone to your eyes to react to that. Now I'm not sure if we're going to have any irritants in heaven and dust and that kind of thing. I don't think we will. 
And I, I'm not sure if we're going to have the um, need the lubrication in heaven. We, we might. I'm not sure. But I do know this. Your, your, your part of your brain that reacts to loss will no longer work. Because there will be no loss. There will be no sense of loss in heaven. That's what he's talking about when he says there's no more tears. He's talking about the loss. Like Revelation 21 where he talks about there's no more death or mourning or crying or pain. That's talking about grieving. There will be no more need to grieve. No more need, to, no more need for loss. Now there was, a, there, there was a person that I read an article on, on, um, on the internet this week about grieving and she has her Ph.D. in grief. Ugh, I'd hate to have that study, wouldn't you? But she says that we grieve for three reasons. We grieve to express our feelings about the loss. We grieve to protest that this loss is unfair or it's untrue or should be undone. And then we grieve because we experience a personal assault on ourselves. Now, we call this the stages of grief, right? You go through these stages of grief when someone in your family dies and goes on to be with the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. We call these the stages of grief, but it's really the reasons or the causes of grief. I want to tell you, that won't be evident in heaven. There will be nobody that dies and leaves you in heaven. There will not be a sick child that is sick for the most, of, the better part of their life in heaven. None of those things will be there. We don't have to worry about loss because there will be no loss. Next, there will be no curse. I'm very excited about this one. There will be no curse in heaven. Revelation 22, 3 says, No longer will there be anything accursed. Remember the curse that was handed down to creation from God from when Adam and Eve sinned and affected everything? Affected everything. Said to Eve, because you sinned first, you're going to have to listen to what he says from now on. And because you sinned, then your punishment's going to be pain in childbirth. Then he looked at the man and he said, and you... You let her talk you into this. For now, you, you got to be the leader. He didn't want it, but you got to be the leader. And he said, and, and not only that, but you, you're not going to get this um, free food anymore. You're going to have to work. You're going to work for it. You're going to have to work the ground, and the ground will be full of thorns and thistles because of this. And by the sweat of your brow will you make your bread. That's the curse. And creation has reacted to that. The ground didn't want to be worked like that wasn't intended to be used like that. wasn't intended for there to be uh, campfires like we see in what they're calling that one in California. And hurricanes and tornadoes and tsunamis and all that wasn't intended. That's the curse. In heaven there won't be a curse. Can you imagine no more storms? No more horrible things that happen that kill thousands and thousands of people. I don't know if there's going to be, you know, children being birthed in heaven, but there is. There's going to be no discomfort to that. And, and women, you, you won't have to listen to any authority except for Jesus Christ himself. And men, you won't have to lead anybody because Jesus is going to do it. Heaven is a place of no mores. No more curse. Revelation 22, 5 says, and night will be no more. No more night. The night has different effects for, on us, and, and it's, it changes with us with age. It does. <clears throat> you had a little kid or grandkid, and they kick the ball into a dark room in the house. They won't go get it until you turn on the light or go in there with them. You know why? Because they don't know what's in there. They don't know what's in the dark. They don't know what to expect. They're not going in there. It's a scary place. They get a little bit older as teenagers, and they, they watch some scary movies. 
And I get a little bit older as adults, and they see the evil in the world, and so now I'm not going down that alley. I'm not going in that dark place. I know what's in the world. I know there's evil. I'm not going out to that barn to check on the horses tonight. I know what's out in those woods behind my barn. Right? You don't do those things. But it's a different reason now because you've aged a little bit. And then you become the, the eldest of, of us in the room. You don't like night at all. It's quiet in your house. Kids aren't there. Your spouse isn't there. And you know it's coming. And you don't want it to be there because the phone doesn't ring in the middle of the night. If it does, it's a bad thing. So when the Bible says there will be no more night in heaven, it means something different to each of us. We're going to know what's there. We're going to know there's no evil there. And we're going to never have to be by ourselves again. No more night in heaven. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Well, heaven is a perfect place, and I need to move on. And Psalm 16 says that in heaven will be perfect pleasure and joy. In 1 Corinthians, in heaven we'll have perfect knowledge. In Revelation 14, it says we're going to have perfect rest. I'm looking forward to that. Jeremiah 31, there will be perfect love, no, in, no motives, no intentions, no, nothing behind the scene. It will be perfect love. And in Revelation 21, 27, we will be perfectly free from evil. It won't be there. Sounds like an awesome place. I like to say that heaven, and maybe you've heard me say this before, but to me, heaven will seem like, or it will be like, an eternity of Sundays. Now, some Sundays are better than others. They are. Every other Sunday, my family gets together for lunch. This is a typical Sunday for us. Every other week. We go to church, go to life group, and we go home. And at home, there's a great big meal. And we, we enjoy that meal together, and we laugh about things that happened in the past or things that happened at church, and, and we, we laugh about those things. And we eat this great big meal, and everyone's got their little parts. You know, this is your part to do and part to clean up, part to put away, and we all take care of that, and we go outside, and, and maybe we'll have a football game. And the oldest of us sit on the porch and cheer, and... Parents and kids, they're playing football in the front yard, and it's, it's great. Then we usually get on the golf cart, or we go for a walk, and we go to the barn, and we feed the animals and the fish, and, and we just hang out at the monkey bars, and we look at the sky. It's a great day. And then we just sit down, and we rest, and we talk, and we laugh. It's, it's a perfect day. I think of heaven as an eternity of those days. It's going to be a lot of things in heaven to do. But I think it's all going to be enjoyable. The difference is, every other week at my house doesn't always go so smoothly. We only have a limited number of dolls. And they fight over them. We only have one toy cell phone. There's a big battle over that. Um, not everybody can play football. Some people get hurt. There's a fight over who's going to do the dishes and who's going to clean up the toys. So it's not always perfect, but in heaven it will be. It will all be perfect. Well, someone might ask you some of these common questions. Who will I recognize? Will I recognize my loved ones? Will they know me? Well, let's look at the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15. Paul's writing to, to uh, the, the Corinthians, the church in Corinth. And he said that Jesus had a glorified body and that Peter, he calls him Cephas, that Peter and that the twelve and then later on 500 people saw him and knew him. They recognized him in his glorified body. In Philippians 3.21, Paul writes that our lowly body will be transformed into a glorious body just like Jesus. And if Jesus was recognizable in his glorified body then we will too. 
will be recognizable in our glorified bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, just as we have been born in the image of man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. We will be like him in body. We will be recognized because he was recognized. Now understand that relationships will be different. They are. We're, we're told that in heaven there's no marriage or giving in marriage. We won't need that. Well, think about the reasons we get married. Well, we get married because we love one another. We can't live without them. That's one of the, the questions that I ask, and I'm looking for that answer when I'm counseling folks who are wanting to get married. Why do you want to get married? I'm looking for, well, I can't make it without her. That's, that's a great answer. We have to have each other in this side of eternity. We've got to have a helper. We've got to have an encourager. So we get married for that. When heaven, we're going to have the Holy Spirit. We're going to have Jesus. That need will already be met. Some of us get married because it's better to marry than to burn, right? Whoa. <laughs> Friends with benefits. We got to get married, baby. Right? You do that. That was invented so that we could have children. We're not going to have children like that in heaven. That's not a need that we're going to have in heaven. Maybe we get married for tax benefits. We're not going to need that in heaven. Relationships will be very different in heaven. You have parents because they have to teach you and because they have to take care of you and, and model for you. You will have Jesus doing for that for you in heaven. We have grandparents so they can spoil you. <laughs> we do. You're not going to do that. Jesus is going to do that in heaven. Relationships will be very, very different because the needs will be very, very different in heaven. Very different. Will you be recognized? Yes. Will you have the same relationship that you have with your family right now? Probably not. It will probably be more along the lines of the very best friend. The BFF. Right? That's what your relationships are going to be like in heaven. You won't need those other things because you won't have those needs. And the needs that you do have, Jesus will meet. So what are we going to do in heaven? More importantly, will I get bored? We were at Disney few years ago actually had a family member get bored in Disney how do you do that well he was a teenager we were at Epcot Center we're looking at we're, we're, we're going through all of the lands you know and seeing all the, the food and the different cultures and you know, I was enthralled by that and he actually says for the love of God can we please find a roller coaster he needed that he had the adrenaline. He had, the, 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 uh, had that built up in his mind. He needed that. Well, what about if, if I need something like that in heaven? Am I going to get bored? Well, listen to what we're going to do in heaven. But keep in mind your needs are different in heaven. Revelation 5.13 says that we will worship in heaven. This is a very interesting verse, by the way, to me. Because remember, I'm the guy that says there's no animals in heaven. Remember that? I told you I was wrong about that. Listen to what this says. Revelation 5.13 And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying. Think about that. I'll blow your mind a little bit. But this is what everything says. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be the blessing and the glory and the honor and the might forever and ever. That's worship. Everything will worship in heaven. We'll worship the Creator. There will be times of worship in heaven. Someone says, well, we'll be worshiping you know, 24-7? Or is that all we're going to do? Just going to sit right there and worship before God? Well, if that is all that we're going to do, that's what you're going to want. Because your needs are different. I don't believe that's all we're going to be doing. I think we're also going to be learning in heaven. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Then I shall know fully. I think there's going to be a time of learning in heaven. Why certain things happened. 
There's going to be a time for serving in heaven. Revelation 22, 3 through 5 tells us that. We're going to be serving God, serving by reflecting His glory and, and meeting His needs and existing there, serving God. Maybe we'll have jobs. Don't, th don't fret over that. Every job in heaven, I mean, come on. It's going to be awesome in heaven. We're going to be serving God. Luke twenty two thirty 30 says we're going to eat and drink at his table in his kingdom. Eat and drinking, eating and drinking at the adult table with Jesus. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Some of you kids, you're not going to be at the adult table in four days. You're going to get the little table elsewhere and there's going to be some food fight and they're going to scream at you from the other room. Don't make me come in there. Right? Then when you actually get of age, turn 13 or 14, maybe there's room and you get to move up to the adult table. In heaven, you're going to be at Jesus' table. It's going to be one humongous table, I guess. But we'll be eating and celebrating there. We're going to be fellowshipping there. In Matthew chapter 8, it says we're going to fellowship with God and with man where we're going to we are going to recline at the table listen to this we're going to recline at the table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that's pretty cool we're going to get to sit with the heroes of old and pick their brains and and find out what that was like I'm going to like to do that with most of them not all of them I'm not sitting next to that chick that has the tent peg remember that one and I ain't sitting by Samson either he starts laughing and throwing elbows, man. I'm out of there. I'm not sitting by him. But some of these other guys, I want to sit down. I want to, I want to hear about it and learn about it. I love to sit with Moses and say, Moses, you called those people stiff-necked. Tell me about it. I want to sit down with those folks and hear about these things. But not only fellowship with people, I'm going to be able to fellowship with God. Revelation 21 says that He will be with us. In heaven, if we decide to climb a mountain, Jesus is going to climb with us. If we decide to go and sit by the chocolate waterfall, Karen, guess who's going to be there? Jesus. He'll be right there with us. See, Jesus will possess the exact same attributes then that he does now Jesus always was and always is always will be he's going to have the same attributes he's going to be omnipresent so when Kenneth when you're climbing the mountain he's going to be with you Karen when you're at the chocolate fountain he's going to be with you David when you're out fly fishing he's going to be with you you don't fly fish but I just threw that out there it's not going to be any hunting in heaven because they can talk obviously and they're going to go hey what are you doing that's going to really freak you out. All right, so Jesus is going to be with all of us there. Remember, Jesus' heaven is anywhere where his throne is, right? Anywhere where the throne is, then Jesus will be there. God will be there. If that's in, in the third heaven, so be it. We're going to rejoice. If that's in the new earth and the, and, and the new heavens, if that's here, like what I think is talking about, what the ancient church believed is that when this new earth is built, there will be a new Garden of Eden, and it will be perfect, and we will all exist like Adam and Eve did, but probably with clothes. We'll all exist there. We will enjoy creation in Luke 23, 43. Jesus used an interesting word to tell the guy that was on the cross beside him, today you will be with me in, what did he say? Paradise. Paradise. A place. A wonderful place of untold glories and magnificent scenery with Jesus in paradise. I think that we will enjoy this creation when it is made new. Why else make the new earth? I think that God will reign from earth. I think His throne will be on the earth. Why else make the new earth? So we can enjoy creation. We want to go for a hike, we'll go for a hike with Jesus. Climb the mountain with Jesus. Sit at the waterfall with Jesus. 
Hebrews 4, 9 says we're going to rest in heaven. That's a good thing. Resting in heaven. Resting from his works or our works just like God did from his. These are the things that we will do and we will never grow bored with them because these are the things that we're going to value the most. Do you ever grow bored hanging out with your grandkids? Probably not. Never going to get bored hanging out with Jesus. You're not going to get bored there because you're, the things that are going to happen are the things that you want to happen. It will never become boring. Well, what, what will my body be like? That's a big question a lot of people have. Am I going to get a new body? I've heard that Christians believe we're going to get a new body. What will that be like? Well, it's going to be very similar to your body now, except without the bad stuff. Remember, you'll be recognizable, but it'll be flesh and bone. You're going to get a glorified body, one that doesn't have to succumb to, to wrinkles and sagging and drooping and visits from Uncle Arthur, right? Not that kind of body, but it will be flesh and blown, and it will be perfect. It will be not corrupted or tainted by sin, not have the curse that was brought upon us because it will be a glorified body. What will your body be like? Similar to what it is now, but better, a lot better. Then the last question that some folks that I want to cover today, some folks have is, that sounds pretty awesome, so how do, I go, how do I get there? How do I get there? Remember the old question that Billy Graham used to have us ask people? If you were to die tonight, that's the best I got. If you were to die tonight and stand before God, and he were to ask you, why should I let you in, what would you tell him? People have a hard time with that question. It's a tough one. If you don't know, you don't know. That's a tough question. They probably won't ask it like that, but they will ask, well, how do I get to go? How, how, do I, how will I get to be there? Well, remember, it's, it's a relationship. You can't tell somebody, all right, you got to do all these great things. Because remember what Jesus said. There's a lot of people who come to heaven to do great things. They cast out demons in my name. They healed people in my name. They fed the sick and visited the, the, those in prison in my name. They did all of those things. They took care of the widows, took care of the orphans, went to church on Sundays. They were my, maybe even church members, but I never knew them. This is the key to heaven. Jesus has got to know you. You've got to know him. Works are not enough. That's why religion never works. It's our attempt, to get to, our attempt to get to heaven. It doesn't work that way. It's a relationship with Jesus is that what does it. If he knows you, you're in. If he doesn't know you, you're out. Well, I thought Jesus knew everybody. I thought he knew everything. Well, he does know you, but he doesn't have a relationship with you until there's an agreement. The agreement is, God, I'm a sinner and I know you can take care of it. Would you do that for me? I'll follow your lead. I'll do what you say. I'll glorify you forever. I just, I want a relationship with you. And I'm not, I'm not perfect. I'm not even going to claim that I can be perfect in you, but I want, I want a relationship with you because I want heaven. And that's what we tell folks. It's not about what you can offer. It's not about what you can do. It's how much you can love and follow and commit to him. That's it. So when folks ask about heaven, be sure you cover how to get there. It's kind of our job. <laughs> There's no plan B. This is it. We're the church. We're to take the gospel to the world. So we have to have the answers like this. 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You got to deal with the sin issue. That's how you get to heaven. Let Jesus deal with the sin issue. He's not going to let sin into heaven. And then confess with your mouth that he's Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Confess to be a Christian. Say that you're going to try to live out for the glory of his name. Believe that Jesus can do this for you. 
And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord. This is what the Bible says. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If they say, how do I get to heaven? You tell them, call upon the Lord. Ask the Lord. Ask Jesus to save you. Whoever does that will receive salvation. If it's pure in their heart, they will receive salvation. You answer those questions that way. Well, I'm not too naive to think that there's some people in the room who've heard about heaven today and thought, hey, that's not too bad. I think I'd like to go there. Well, the questions I just answered for you. Would you have a relationship with Jesus? Would you give yourself to Him completely today? And do those things. Allow Him to take care of your sin. Allow Him to be Lord of your life and then live for the glory of His name during the next song. And we're going to stay seated today through this song. Just think of that. Think of, you know, is, is heaven a place where I want to be? And if so, am I going to be there? And if not, how can I, how can I fix that? And there'll be people standing at each corner of the stage while this song is being sung. I know everybody's sitting. Y'all come on. While everybody's sitting, means you have to get up and come to the front where everybody can see you, and that's okay. Because you want people to see you. That you're serious about living for Christ. You're serious about heaven as your eternal home. That's okay. So we'll have people at the corners waiting to receive you. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this awesome promise. I felt like I didn't do it justice today trying to explain the unexplainable, but I know that your Holy Spirit will make that evident to us in the right time. Father, I pray that you will burden us all for heaven not be so wrapped up in the here and now that we forget about our blessed hope. I pray there's someone here today that doesn't know you, has never followed you, never given their life, doesn't even know you. Father, that you will encourage them to to step out on faith and give themselves fully to you today. And others who are encouraged by this, that they would also be thankful this week and and glorify your name in front of their relatives and their friends and co-workers. And that would be a time we can share your goodness. We're so thankful for the ways you blessed us, God. Have your way in us. We commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen.